Hi, I'm Kwame Kwarten, and welcome to this month's Horizons session, which is all about breaking into the industry they call music. So that is the music business, the music industry. Mm. Horizons is a new charity working in the Harringay and Enfield boroughs of London to create opportunities for young people within the creative arts and in sports and in technology and in academia. All right, so let's go around the room firstly. If you could say your name and then say hi. Hi, my name's Emerald. How's it going? Superb. Hi, Nick. my name's Joseph. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Cheyenne. How's it going? <laughs> Superb. OK, so today we are chatting to young music fans and getting some top advice from DJ and broadcaster Emerald Rose Lewis. So let's start by finding out about the talent right here in this studio. Cheyenne, I believe you are a singer-songwriter. Is there something that you love doing and that you would like to pursue? Um, I think for me personally, I'm, I've been to a lot of festivals and I've performed at a lot of festivals in my local area. So I think that's something I definitely want to get into and I definitely want to start recording my own music and mm -hmm. putting it out. I think I would say I've always grown up with music and I think that's where it starts. But I think it really starts with my sister when we was there, when we when there was no Bluetooth. Like, we didn't have Bluetooth there. Mm. Um, and we were just jamming to the radio. We'd put like, oh, can you put the Taylor Swift record in the DJ? And we would just mm. be singing there and we'd be told to be quiet because we were making too much noise. But I think, especially as I went into secondary school and I met my teacher and my personal like teacher Laura Juice mm. is where it really really kicked off for me and I think I always take that on board that like I am very thankful for her because I would not be here without her today mm. and I just thank my dad and my sister because like they have played a massive music influence in my life. Mm. I love that you gave a shout out to your teacher as well though I think that's really good that's it's really good awesome. listen family Family support is is so much. Just never take for granted. Hey, come on now. Never. Absolutely. Normally I'd have a bell here. I normally have a bell, but tell you what, <laughs> I'll do that instead. <laughs> All right, so let's keep it moving. Um, tell us about your own love of music. So my love of music really just stemmed because um, I grew up in a church, so my whole family would just, like, take lead of um, the music side of church. and um, Yeah playing instruments, singing. So from a young age, I've always been singing. Yeah. Thought, I wish I picked up an instrument when I was younger, but... Happens. Yeah, fortunately, uh, as I grew up, my cousins really picked up music from a production point of view. So when I was about 10, I was a five, six years ago now, mm. um, they started doing what I do nowadays, so like making music from, you know, home. I picked it up last year. I really needed that creative outlet, especially because I was stuck at home. Nothing much I could do, so... I really just picked up a new skill, a new hobby, and that was music for me. So uh, as an artist, I go by the name Dream. Uh, I'm on all platforms. Started music, making music about a year ago, two years ago. But yeah, it's definitely something I want to pursue. Yeah. And how are you spelling Dream? D-R-E-4-M. So yeah, <laughs> the four is just to make it stand out a bit more. <laughs> Yeah, it makes you Googleable. Yeah, of it does make you Googleable. It means that the dream won't come after you from America. <laughs> Cheers. Anyway, enough for the legal advice. That'll be ten quid. <laughs> um, next up, we have the Emerald. My name's Emerald. Um, I'm a DJ, a broadcaster, and a presenter. Mm -hmm. I have a radio show on Rinse FM. I've been on Rinse FM for about nine years now. Wow, Emerald. DJ, mm. was that something that was taught to you or was that something that you took upon yourself to learn? In those early days, I started being offered um, gigs and shows and sets. And I wanted to say yes, but I didn't want to say yes until I completely knew what I was doing. Especially as a female, I think people expect you to be doing a half assed job mm. and to be sort of coasting especially, I think, as a mixed-race person, there's a lot of tokenism that comes with that as well. OK, let's go in on that. Why? Why? Why Why do people expect females to be doing a half-assed job? I say this, by the way, yeah. because my wife is a DJ. OK. So I fully know where you're going. Um, I mean, it's... 
it's it's it's, just it's not rocket science. It's the patriarchy. <laughs> okay, the patriarchy. It's the patriarchy. It's the way that systemically we are set up and perceived as females, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's just an automatic perception when you walk mm -hmm. into any job or any room. People expect you to not actually have the brains behind what you're doing and know what you're doing. Mm. Um, especially for a lot of presenters, I found that was a thing. Presenters who are crossover into DJs, that they thought, oh, right, you're just going to press play on a, some, on a pre mix mix or whatever. Mm. And I think also as a brown person with like diversity hiring and stuff like that, people expect you to just be there to f tick a box. Mm rather than actually be good and skilled at your craft. I think a lot of the gigs that I got early on, I was the only female on the lineup mm. and I was getting a lot of like midnight slots at clubs and I was like, oh, I've literally only started out. Why am I getting the midnight slot? You haven't even heard me mix before, never. Mm. So I knew there's no way I wasn't a diversity hire. There's no way I w it wasn't tokenism. Mm. So what I really wanted to do was do a lot of proving people wrong. And so when I got offered these gigs, I turned a lot of them down mm. and I made sure that I was technically up to par and I knew exactly what I was doing mm. before I stepped into that realm because I wanted to represent myself in a really professional way and I loved music mm. and I never wanted to be a tick box. I mm. wanted to be good at my craft and own it and do that for my for who I am representing as a, a race and as a as a female mm. and also just as a DJ. Like, mm, yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm taking this seriously, you know. Yeah. For me, it's not a joke. Yeah. So, what I did, going back to the original question, was I had a lot of the equipment to my uh, what was available for me to use being at rinse fm anyway yeah so i made the most of my time and my resources and i was in that studio all the time self-teaching i had a couple of lessons from a couple of friends mm -hmm. but the thing is i found with djing is everybody djs differently so sometimes when you watch someone and they teach you something you pick up certain little skills that are personal to that person you take that into your own learning and your own teaching and there you develop your own style yeah so you kind of only need to really learn the fundamentals and then it's all practice after that yeah. And I and think gigs. And gigs, yeah. And, gigs. and experience. Yeah. Exactly. I snuck into this into this venue called the Coronet, which doesn't exist anymore. It was quite legendary in Elephant Castle. And I saw MIA perform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember sit, standing in the crowd and being just so incredibly wowed by what I did. Um, since then I've become a long time fan. And in that moment I remember being like, I wanna do that and I wanna be on stage with her and I wanna you know, I just want to do that. Not necessarily be a performer, but work in music, yeah, yeah. be on a stage, mm. be doing that kind of stuff. And like her, her beats really spoke to me more than her lyrics did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then fast forward, maybe 10 years later, mm. I was a tour DJ for for two years. And there you go. Doing backing vocals, yeah. all sorts. So, that does yeah. happen. It does. And that really I does. I didn't think that it would ever. It's, listen, <laughs> life is the spookiest, I swear. Mm. The old be careful what you wish for mm. is a, such a strange thing because you'll be like, okay, that's what I want to do. And literally sometimes it's almost, they say speaking it into existence, but it's that thing of like, you said it, universe heard it and flung it back at you and went, are you ready? Okay, go. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's really weird. I truly believe in manifestation. Mm. Obviously, you can't just speak something and then sit back and wait for it to happen. Mm. No, but no. But the more you speak about it, the more you have the conversations with people about it, mm. the closer you're moving to into that realm that you're envis envisaging for yourself, the, every conversation that you have about it brings you a little bit closer. The ripple effect happens. I really, honestly, truly stand by that belief. If you could look into a crystal ball mm. right now and go, do you know what? In five years' time, where do I want to be? I want to be an inspiration. I want to... Nothing too small then. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> inspiration, though. That's the thing. Like We had Black History Month last week and yeah. there was a bunch of people, especially his close friends, that were at the front of the thing. And we were like, guy, Joseph. And he was singing. And then he was like, he is an inspiration because even... Every, he, I have his songs on my playlist and I listen to them. I'm thinking, that's my Aww. friend. I know him. Go so on. it's like... He is. I That's think he's amazing. kind of already succeeded in that, but I think I get where he's coming from. Yeah, I think Thank also you, just in the way that Cheyenne introduced herself earlier and she said, I want to do what Joseph does. Mm. Oh, yeah. You should definitely take that with you because you're even though it might be in a bigger capacity that you see yourself in five years, you're already doing that. You're already manifesting that. Yeah. I'm coming to you. <laughs> Don't think you got away with it. There's a there's a new artist called Laura Spencer Smith who's mm. kind of launched at the moment, mm. and she does small tours. She does festivals, 
and I kind of just want to be there. I want to be known, but I don't want to be too too big because I I need me. Um, so that's kind of where I want to be. At. I mean, so you you you're kind of like you want it as as a career and to be able to earn from it. But you don't need all of the kind of fame trappings business. Yeah, mm. I think... Isn't that great that that's a choice now? Mm. And that people are like able to kind of Back separate off. that off. Yeah. And that people want that. Mm. Yeah. Because mm, there's so much, like, if you look at, like, the Kardashians, for example, bad example, but <laughs> they don't have a choice. Wherever they go, people are going to know them. Mm. And everyone's in their business. And I feel like that's something that... I don't want I don't want people to be in my business all the time. Mm. So I think being able to know who people know I want people to know who I am mm-hmm. and I want people to know me for my music, but I don't want that to be my main like oh she's just the girl who writes music, mm. you know. Mm. So that's kind of I just want to be more on festivals. Sound mm. like you want to songwrite for other people as well by the sounds of it. Mm. Maybe you haven't thought, got that. I've yet. never thought about it. Yeah, it feels I, like because I like covers as well. I like singing other people's songs as well, mm, not yeah, just it feels writing like my own. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the the energy that you give off is the artist career, but also could songwrite for other people. I don't know. It's why. a very viable career path that you should look into if you if you, I mean, by the sounds of it, you're a very talented songwriter. And a lot of singers that I know, they have their own singing projects as well, which do great on kind of the level and the scale that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But behind closed doors, and not a lot of people know about it, they're going to writing camps, they're writing songs for people like Dua Lipa, mm. they're doing all of that. And they're making their money doing that. And, it's, and then it's like they, they get to have their career on the scale that they want it, but they're still working in music on a massive scale without the fame. So, right now, you've got stuff happening at the moment in schools. As you said, Cheyenne, you've gone, Mm -hmm. do you know what, I've got a teacher, I've got X, Y, Z. You're like, okay, I kind of, you've obviously performed on stage because Cheyenne here was screaming when you were (laughs) performing. Mm -hmm. So that's already happening. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, okay, cool. You got that, but if you, again... And this is almost like reaching out into this void and kind of going, okay, if I could grab something else, if if there was something else, musically speaking, that I could have, that I could bring into my sort of daily life Mm. at school, what would it be? Would you like to have more, you know, interviews with, I don't know, singers Mm. about Mm. what they do? Would you like classes in understanding record deals would you like to know what music publishing is would you would you i could go on you know yeah um for me as of right now specifically right now i feel like it's a big thing just getting not just my music out there but my brand out there so like me as a person not just obviously dream but i want him to know who i am like joseph you know what i mean so i want him to know who i am like a lot of my music, they don't even know what I look like for the so, people. That... So hold on, let's just get this right. So in a way, what you're saying, if I've got this right, is okay. you wouldn't mind people that knew a bit more about that side of things mm-hmm. to be able to give you kind of instruction and lessons in it, mm-hmm. in that. Yeah. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And, and what about you? Um, I think I would like to probably be in kind of his position right now where he's recording music and he's performing it, but a bit more. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So I think I've, I've like I would like I said I wanted to do I want to do more festival work. So more. hold on, so a recording studio in your school? Yeah, I mean we have like a mini one. It's like yeah. this tiny little one. A and banging like, one. <laughs> it would be nice. It would yeah. be nice to have like someone who's professionally writes music with mm. Dan and say you know what, or even someone that can give me a backing track and be like write a song to this mm-hmm. and then guide you, you through it guide me through it and mm. then i can just put it out there and just mm. see how people react and, and then maybe say lessons in putting the song out like how yes. you do it how like, do you do it how do what's you get the, exactly what's like, the, the correct as they say metadata which is a word that you should know about but you don't know about but you would like to know about you know because you've got to put all of that stuff onto your song yeah because you know what if you don't you know what happens you don't get no money back for the, for the tune. For six years, if you don't claim on it, what happens is they say it falls off the end of a cliff. As in, right, you can't, past six years, you can't collect on it. Mm. Okay, so you can't collect on that song. And do you know what happens with the income that has been gained from, from that? 
mm. it gets split between the highest earners. Oh. So that means you write a song, if you don't claim on it correctly, Ed Sheeran, Sam Smith, blah, they're just like, nice one, thanks I didn't know that. Oi, Crazy. I've got facts for you, come on. Crazy. Be careful, yeah? yeah <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm yeah. just saying. I've got to ask the question about Sam, the alarm talent competition. They pick someone with, it has to be your own original song, your own lyrics, and you get to perform it at Alexandra Palace. I was only told about it very, very recently. And I think it was the week before I was told about it. And me and Laura had been working on this song called Engraved Memories that I wrote. And she was like, you need you need to perform this. And so she and um, Miss Shakespeare introduced it to me. We recorded it and um, I thought it wasn't going to go through because when I tried to send it through at home, it wasn't working. But it went through and they've heard it and I was a nervous wreck because I was like, I hate listening. When I record something on my phone, I don't like the sound of it. And I lost my voice that week, the entire week. So I was like, this is not going to go well. So it's a, it's I uh, hopefully I get in and I think that would be a really good place to start because that would be the first time anyone has heard outside of those two teachers have heard something that I've written myself. Mm. So it's it's both nerve wracking but it's also exciting. Um, if even like even if I don't get in, like cool, then I will find another way to kind of get it out there. So, Emerald, Yo. mentor, mentor, influential people in your life, musically speaking, go ahead, mm. ring the bell. Ring the bell, ring the bell. They've come in the form of mostly peers, I think, okay. and people that maybe didn't even realise that they were mentors. Right. And just inspirational people that I've been around. I remember when I was coaching, when I was being kind of coached before I took over the Drive Time show on Rinse FM, Julie Adenuga, who Huge. is yeah. massive now, and she, I took over the drive show after her. I sat, she sat in a lot of my first radio sessions and gave me notes. Yeah. And I guess in some way, shape, or form, was my mentor. Yeah. Also, Katie B. Yeah. No, Katie B. Yeah. Katie B is another person that I was a tour DJ for and is now a really close friend of mine and is someone who I absolutely love and adore. Um, my f some of my first experiences of playing to massive crowds and being in proper clubs and being backstage and sort of navigating that world were with her. And we grew very close when we were on tour together and those experiences were are some of my earliest and most formative experiences when it comes to performing. She's still someone that I go to for advice and who is somebody who I consider like family to me mm, now. Mm. And is somebody who's really got their head screwed on when it comes to navigating the music industry. Mm, which As you a, need. She was very young and obviously female in in a space that was extremely male dominated. It still is, but was way more so back then. How and, are we going to um, sort that out, by the way? Well, I gotta that's, be, not, listen, that's not listen. a question that can be answered in one sentence. I, I know. Come on, patriarchy. Move out of the way, man. Make, it, some, make some room. Make some like, room. Come We're on. getting there. Yeah. We're getting there. Slowly. I've never been shy to ask for advice. I'm a very personable person. and Yeah, I've I, I found mentors along the way, here and there, from very inspirational women in my life. Interesting. Sorry, you've just reminded me of something. Ask a question, be a fool for a minute. Don't ask a question, be a fool for a lifetime. There you go. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, asking questions is where it's at. Definitely. I come from a family of journalists as well. Ah, so you know all about asking questions. Yeah, <laughs> I've always been taught to ask the questions. Like, I, I don't really like the expression knowledge is power because it's a bit of like a doom and gloom and like sort of overpowering way. It kind of sounds a little bit like dictatory and like capitalism-y, yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it really is. Mm. And knowing what you're doing, like I said about earlier, like, I don't like to be in a space where I'm not clued up. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think you got to accept that everybody's human and until they know something, they don't know. That's just a fact. Mm. I think people are often comforted by that as well because a lot of people also don't know. Mm. And when you're sitting in a room full of people and you, say, for example, you're at a Q&A or something like that. I've done a lot of these panel talks where I've been on the panel and I think a lot of people in the audience 
are afraid to ask a question or, or, or someone's talking about something really technical and they're like, I have no idea what this person's talking about. Mm. And then someone next to them will ask a question and everyone will be like, yeah, I'd actually quite like to know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. And more often than not, the majority of people also don't know. Mm. So I think it's important to just be brave and get the knowledge that you need. And you They say that in school as well. They're like, if you don't know something, say. Mm. There's a likely chance there's like 10 or 15 people that don't know as well. Mm. Do you know, uh, when I'm lecturing, one of the things that I do, and a lot of people that go to the Ultimate Seminar will know this, when I, I always say, before I start this lecture, I'm going to let you all know right now that I don't do... Has anybody got any questions right at the end? Mm. What I do is I just point at you and you've got to have a question ready. <laughs> a big thank you to my guests for joining us today. If you've been inspired by today's session, do subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you want to find out more about future opportunities or help Horizons to deliver them, you can follow at HEP Horizon or check out the website horizonscharity.org.